Is preventing human extinction a bad argument for climate action? In climate discourse, it's not uncommon to hear that we are headed towards human extinction. There's Extinction Rebellion. It's there both in the name and their lecture, Headed for Extinction and What to Do About It. There's this Instagram reel. Do you believe in climate change? Yes, ma'am. Did you know it could potentially lead to human extinction within the next hundred years? Oh yeah, absolutely. There's Climate Endgame, a 2022 paper published in PNAS that asked in the very first paragraph, could anthropogenic climate change result in worldwide societal collapse or even eventual human extinction? At the more extreme end, you have people like Guy McPherson, who has predicted that there will be no more humans on Earth in 2026. Enjoy your final three years, I guess. <laughs> and then there's my videos. I mean, we're headed for extinction. Humans themselves might ultimately meet their ends before this extinction event is over. I think we need to talk about the possibility of Homo sapiens driving themselves to extinction. Not only is another mass extinction event likely, we are already in one. There's no guarantee humans will be spared. I, I don't want us to go extinct, is what I'm saying. I've argued in private as well for climate action on the grounds of preventing human extinction. So if it feels like I'm calling out anyone in this video, well, I'm calling out myself most of all. I understand why people make this argument. For one thing, it sounds likely enough, or at least I long thought so. For another, human extinction is dramatic and rhetorically grand. It evokes the epic human story by warning that it's soon coming to an end. At the same time, the argument undercuts human hubris. Humans aren't so exceptional that we can't go extinct just like any other species, you know? Also, in the year of El Nino 2023, we still somehow live in a world where some people don't care about climate change. I understand the frustration climate activists can feel when talking with such people. The clock is ticking on global heating, we're hurtling towards catastrophe, and we just want something to be done about that. How are you not seeing how serious this is? But complacent and comfortable people often just shrug and go, ah, what are you gonna do? It is what it is. Met with this, it's tempting to raise the stakes and nothing can possibly raise them more than everyone dying. Why is the climate crisis bad? Because it could lead to human extinction. That's why you should care. What could be more important than preventing human extinction? But I wonder, is this a bad argument for climate action? The reason I even started thinking about that question is because of the precipice, existential risk and the future of humanity written by Toby Ord. The book makes a compelling case that climate change won't lead to human extinction. Well, a compelling enough case to convince me. I no longer think we're likely to go extinct because of climate change. So that's nice, isn't it? Sometimes my videos get bleak. I'm afraid that simply comes with the subject matter I deal with on this channel. But today I actually have good news. Climate change equals not human extinction. Probably. But more interesting than that, I think the precipice unintentionally and ironically makes a compelling case that 
the human extinction doesn't really matter. It's beside the point, certainly when it comes to climate change. Much of this video will be in response to this book. I think it illuminates deeper reasons why invoking human extinction as a reason to take climate action are misguided and even problematic. And I mean beyond human extinction from climate change being unlikely. When you frame climate change around whether it will cause human extinction, that way of understanding the problem comes with a certain emphasis and erasure that I find troubling and trivializing. Before we kick off this journey, a note on terminology. I will say climate change throughout this video, as that is the term Toby Ord uses in the book. Personally, I find climate change too tame a term for what's happening, and I prefer saying either climate crisis, climate breakdown, climate emergency, climate cataclysm, climate clusterfuck, climate clown shoes, climate breakdance, or climate gates. Funny how climate change isn't a bigger scandal than it is. I mean, someone's responsible. Anywho, with that said, hmm. Yeah, can't argue with that. In the long run, we are all dead. Ow! Gah! Ah. So, The Precipice is a book about all the things that could bring about the end of the world. Obviously, it should be right up my alley. The end of the world is kind of my thing. It's something I'm into. And I did find The Precipice an engaging read, but it's a book I both deeply agree and deeply disagree with. I agree with a central point of the book, the one encapsulated in the title. We are indeed standing at a precipice, a cliff edge, a decisive moment in history where humanity can either destroy the world or create a much better one. To me, we are standing at the precipice because of the threat of climate change. There are worrying signs that global heating is accelerating. Recent research says that while the rate of global heating was 0.18 degrees centigrade per decade between 1970 and 2010, it's now around 0.27 degrees per decade, an increase attributed to reduced sulfate pollution from shipping. As the Earth is already 1.2 degrees centigrade hotter than in pre-industrial times, you can calculate yourself how quickly 0.27 degrees a decade takes us to 1.5 or 2 degrees, where, of course, it's all but guaranteed that we'll cross several tipping points and set off irreversible feedback loops that just make the problem worse. The image of the cliff edge seems apt for climate change, and these days it feels like we're right at the edge. To echo the words of Naomi Klein, Noam Chomsky, and David Wallace Wells, climate change is an existential crisis. And I'm not talking about the early 20s philosophy student Albert Camus fan kind of existential crisis. No, this is literally a crisis of existence, because this shit threatens all life on Earth including humans. We need to back off from the precipice and imagine this was happy. What I'm getting at is that when I read a title like The Precipice, Existential Risk and the Future of Humanity, I can't help but think about climate change. If anything is an existential risk, which is almost the same as existential crisis, if anything matters to the future of humanity, it's that, right? Well, here we come to a disagreement between me and this book. Toby Ord doesn't consider climate change the biggest threat to humanity like I do. To be fair, he does think it's important. It's in his top 5 most dangerous existential risks. Well, it shares 5th place with 2 other risks, so top 7 I guess. The reason Toby Ord doesn't rank climate change higher is because it won't realistically lead to human extinction. Why is that? But first, let's ask, how would climate change lead to human extinction in the first place? Hmm. Yes, this is a cup. Is this what all phenomenological research consists in? Ow! <sighs> Ah. 
I must admit that before reading this book, I never gave much thought to how exactly climate change would lead to human extinction. I just had a vague idea of tipping points and feedback loops unleashing accelerated climate breakdown until Earth becomes a hellish and barren planet with incessant heat, deserts everywhere, massive plant and wildlife die off, constant storms, hurricanes, tornadoes, diseases, and every single cloud in the sky being in the shape of a hand giving the finger. And in this timeline you incidentally no longer say flipping the bird because birds went extinct decades ago and so you lost all reference for that expression. And with that the last human would die on hothouse earth or Venus 2 electric boogaloo. Toby Ord, however, gets more specific than that. Or maybe not, that was a weirdly specific scenario just now. Anyway, Toby Ord presents four ways that climate change could conceivably lead to human extinction. Number one, runaway greenhouse effect. This is the closest to what I described above, where tipping points and feedback loops, let's call them TPs and FBLs from now on, just go bananas. In theory, it's possible for the world to get hundreds of degrees hotter and make the oceans literally boil, at which point complex life, including human beings, duh, is impossible. But for this scenario to play out, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere would need to be absurdly high, certainly above 5000 parts per million, or ppm. I know, pp, haha, get the laughter over with, this is serious. If we burnt all the fossil fuels in the world, we might reach over 2000 ppm, which is well below this threshold because, as I'm sure some of you know, 2000 is less than 5000. For comparison, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, which is really the most direct measure of climate change you can get, is right now at over 420 ppm. Nice number, not so nice reality. In pre-industrial times, the concentration was 280 ppm, so we're talking an extra 140 ppm since then, a 50% ppm increase in just two centuries. For the past hundreds of thousands of years, as long as there's been humans, the ppm never went above 300. I repeat, it's now over 420 ppm, the highest concentration in 14 million years. And we're already seeing how bad things are getting. So burning all the fossil fuels in the world and reaching 2000 ppm would be... But at least it wouldn't boil the oceans away. Whew. Glad we're dodging that bullet. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, you should still be worried about TPs and FBLs, but uh, such an extreme runaway greenhouse effect as described above is off the table. But what about moist greenhouse effects? Moist greenhouse effect isn't just fun to say because I know some people don't like the word moist. A moist greenhouse effect is also caused by TPs and FBLs gone coconuts and is also a scenario that would wipe out humanity if it happened. The planet wouldn't get as hot as in a runaway greenhouse effect scenario, it wouldn't boil the oceans, but the atmosphere would contain a lot more water vapor than today, hence the moist in moist greenhouse effect. This vapor would get lost to space, a process that would eventually drain the planet of water. Like with a runaway greenhouse effect, a moist greenhouse effect is also unlikely to be triggered from human industry caused carbon emissions alone. However, the science is more uncertain and so ORT doesn't give us any handy numbers. I guess we'd need well over 2000 ppm for that too? Which again… But humanity wouldn't go moistly extinct, thank goodness. But look, these extreme scenarios only deal indirectly with human extinction. 
I mean, humanity would probably go extinct way before the oceans literally boil or all the water evaporates to space, right? These scenarios deal with planetary limits, not human ones, and it's human extinction we're talking about. So let's look at something that directly concerns the limits of the human body. Number three, heat stress. Toby Ord considers whether Earth could get too sexy for humans to live on. Wait, that doesn't sound right. If the Earth gets sexier, wouldn't that prevent extinction by turning on people? Oh, hot! Toby Ord considers whether Earth could get too hot for humans to live on. Sorry, my bad. Anyway, humans need to maintain an internal body temperature of 37 degrees centigrade. A vital way the human body does that is through sweating, which gets rid of excess body heat. However, it can get so hot that the combined heat and humidity, known as the wet bulb temperature, gets so intense that it's literally impossible for even people in peak physical health to survive for more than a few hours, because at that point, you can't sweat anymore, which means your body can't cool off, and instead you effectively boil from the inside. Researchers estimate that a wet bulb temperature of 37 degrees centigrade is the limit of human survivability, and weather stations have recorded this threshold 10 times so far. You don't need me to tell you that continued global heating is only going to make this more common. So, could extreme wet bulb temperatures make the whole Earth uninhabitable and thus drive humanity to extinction? Ord doesn't think so. He considers a scenario where the Earth gets 20 degrees centigrade hotter than in pre-industrial times, which is well above the 13 degrees that Ord considers a plausible upper limit for global heating by 2300. Even at an unlikely 20 degrees centigrade of heating, there would still be places on Earth that never see days above the survivability threshold. So a 20 degree world would be... Uh, not human extinction. Woo! But what if the problem isn't that it gets too hot for the human body to function, but that it gets too hot to grow food? Could climate change induced famine drive humanity to extinction? Number four, famine. Ord doesn't consider this likely either. He says that even under the most pessimistic projections from the IPCC, food production would only decrease by 16% worldwide. Besides, with adaptation measures, we could increase crop yields by as much as 15%. So no risk of human extinction there. But I have a few critiques of this analysis. For one thing, Ord doesn't talk about food production beyond 2050. When he says 16% decrease, that's in 2050 relative to 2000. What about food production in 2100? Or 2300? Or in that extreme 20 degree world he talked about? I mean, should I bury a crate of canned peaches for my great 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 grandchildren to find in 200 years or not? For another thing, in the study Ord cites for the 16% decrease number, the authors acknowledge certain limitations of the study. It doesn't take into account adaptation, which could increase yields, something that Ord points out in the book, nor does the study consider environmental factors like water scarcity and land degradation, which could decrease yields, something Ord doesn't point out in the book. For a third thing, when Ord considers how climate change will impact food production, he narrowly focuses on the effect of increased temperatures on crops, overlooking that increased heat isn't the only consequence of climate change that matters here. Oh no, climate change is a whole smorgasbord of things that will take away your smorgasbord. Droughts, floods, storms, pests, weeds, diseases, sea level rise, shrinking glaciers and ice caps, all this also negatively impact food production, and all are made more likely and intense with climate change. And Ord doesn't consider any of them. Doesn't mention them. For a fourth thing, Ord says that since crops are more sensitive to cold than to heat, 
higher temperatures aren't that big of a problem for a crop production. But you don't have to look further than to wheat to find a very common crop that is sensitive to heat stress at temperatures above 27.8 degrees centigrade and reaches a critical threshold at 32.8 degrees centigrade, where important enzymes in the wheat start to break down. To be honest, even after googling I'm still not really clear on what enzymes even are. I just understand that they're important for plant growth. Or for growth in any organism. Wheat is one of the top three crops grown worldwide, and a staple food for 35% of the world's population. Hearing this, I can't help but worry about multiple breadbasket failure, a scenario where several major agricultural regions experience crop failure simultaneously, something that will, of course, become more and more likely the hotter the planet gets. But Ord never talks about multiple breadbasket failures, which I consider something of an oversight. For a fifth thing, the study Ord cites for that stat on 15% increase in global food production with adaptation, Shalinor et al. 2014, contains these graphs, showing the effects of temperature increase on crop yields in the tropics. As you can see, even with adaptation, the yields for wheat decline dramatically, maize also declines, and rice sees only moderate increases in yield. So sure, maybe global food production won't suffer too badly from climate change, but what about people living in the tropics? Toby Ord, what about people in the tropics? Please tell me they'll be okay. Those were my five criticisms of how the precipice covers the impact of climate change on food production. Did I just destroy Toby Ord with facts and logic? Probably not. I suspect that even if you accounted for all my objections above and got a revised number for climate change induced drops in food production, a number perhaps significantly higher than 16%, it still wouldn't refute Toby Ord's main argument that climate change won't lead to human extinction. Because even if food production dropped by 99%, it would be Still 1% food left for some people. Human extinction averted! So yeah, considering these four scenarios that Toby Ord presents, I'm confident that no matter how bad climate change gets, some humans will survive. And as long as we don't go extinct, that's all that matters, I guess. To reiterate, good news, humanity is not going extinct because of climate change. And since I've argued before that it would, I'm, I'm so, so sorry, everyone. I did a misinformation and no one has ever done a misinformation on YouTube before. That was uncool. That was so uncool of me. And considering how not cool the planet is, I believe it's on the rest of us to step up and be cool. Because that is one of the best ways we can uh, deal with global heating, is to be cool. But what I did was uncool. It was so uncool. And I, I apologize. Deeply, deeply apologize for that. I hereby distance myself from those very uncool statements. Really distancing myself. Look how good I am at distancing. So, uh, while I'm distancing myself back there, let me ask, have you noticed something wrong here? I teased early in the video that there are deeper problems with arguing that climate change will lead to human extinction, 
beyond the unlikelihood of it. Now, the factual aspect matters, of course, if you argue for climate action, because if we don't, we'll go extinct, and then it turns out that that scenario isn't likely, you risk being dismissed as a fear-mongering alarmist, as opposed to just being dismissed as a buzzkill for bringing up climate change. But the deeper problem here is that you also risk undercutting the seriousness of climate change. Because if you start with human extinction, then anything short of that sounds like no big deal in comparison. It could make some people go, Ow! Oh. So it's not that serious then. Well, if by that serious you mean literal human extinction, then no, climate change is not that serious. But it's still plenty serious, wouldn't you say? But more important than that, to argue from human extinction is to put a certain frame around the problem, and I find that frame troubling. When you make human extinction the central question of that problem, the very condition determining success and failure in resolving it, you do a certain emphasis and erasure that I find trivializing, even... Hey, I have a problem. I'm so lost. How did I get out of here? Oh, I think you just throw the book. Oh yeah. How does that work anyway? I don't know. Ah! Try throwing it the other way, maybe? Yeah, I guess we are living in the end times. Ow! Ah! Ugh, not again. I think I can make the problem with the framing and emphasis clearer by reading directly from the book. So, let's go. Here he talks about a 13 degree world, which he describes as a global calamity of unprecedented scale. It would be an immense human tragedy, disproportionately impacting the most vulnerable populations. Yeah, that's, that's bad. What can I say? I agree. But the purpose of this chapter is finding and assessing threats that pose a direct existential risk to humanity. Even at such extreme levels of warming, it is difficult to see exactly how climate change could do so. So, we're only dealing with real problems then, is, is, what I'm, is what I'm getting. It's the vibe I'm getting. Let me read on. Major effects of climate change include reduced agricultural yields, scary, sea level rises, very scary, water scarcity, super scary, increased tropical diseases, ocean acidification, uh, and the collapse of the Gulf Stream. Whew. Don't like that. I'd say this climate change thing is a real problem. But while extremely important when assessing the overall risks of climate change, none of these threaten extinction or irrevocable collapse. Cool. We're not all gonna die. Yay. Here's another example from a page later. A world of 20 degrees centigrade of warming would be an unparalleled human and environmental tragedy, forcing mass migration and perhaps starvation too. This is reason enough to do our utmost to prevent anything like that from ever happening. Again, what can I do but agree? However... Our present task is identifying existential risks to humanity, and it is hard to see how any realistic level of heat stress could pose such a risk. Well, golly, thank goodness humanity will be safe. Are you seeing it yet? Let me read you one more, this time from a footnote, where he talks about global food supply. Specifically, that statistic from earlier about a 16% decrease in global food production. 
Such a reduction in food supply would have disastrous consequences for millions of people. Yeah, that's true. They would starve. Probably one of the worst ways to die. I'm glad Ord points this out. But... Woods pose little risk to civilization. Do you see what I mean by the emphasis? What really matters for this book, for existential risk, is humanity and civilization, not people as such. Since climate change doesn't pose much of a threat to humanity or civilization, then, according to Ord, that only puts it in the top seven biggest existential risks facing us. Which I'm sure he would stress still makes it very important, and I'll concede to that. You could say that complaining about this, about someone rating climate change only, the seventh biggest threat to the world, is a bit like complaining about being served only the seventh best pizza in the world. Like, dude, come on, the pizza is delicious, even if it isn't the best, and climate change is very dangerous, even if it isn't the most dangerous. Only, I'm not complaining about relative ranking here, although I would argue that climate change is the most important problem we're facing. What I take issue with is, again, the framing, the frame of human extinction, of existential risk. I think this is a bad frame to analyze and understand a problem with, for several reasons, especially when it comes to climate change. I've already brought up the first problem, the problem of how human extinction makes everything else seem like no big deal in comparison, and how that undercuts the seriousness of climate change. So it's not that serious then. I think talking in terms of human extinction trivializes the pain and suffering that climate change entails, because in this frame, the condition for success isn't preventing pain and suffering, it's preventing human extinction. And it doesn't really take much to do that. Which brings me to the second problem. The second problem is that it sets too low a bar for success. Literally 99% of all people could die in some catastrophe, and the 1% that remained could still go, We did it! We didn't go extinct! We should aim a little bit higher than that, shouldn't we? We should prevent human extinction and achieve climate justice, for instance. The third problem is, well, in those quotes from earlier, especially the one that brings up how extreme global heating would disproportionately impact the most vulnerable populations, which I agree with, before then immediately saying it's difficult to see how that would threaten humanity, does it sound a little bit like the book is saying, don't worry, it's only the poor that are going to die. Now, I want to be upfront, I'm sure this isn't Toby Ord's intention. After all, before he became a professional existential risk analyst, he dedicated his career to combating global poverty. Also, he cares a lot about altruism. So, I don't think his personal attitude is one of fuck the poor. Hey, Editor Weirdo here. Speaking of altruism, Toby Ord has stated in an interview, just not in this book, that climate change is probably the biggest cause for doing good in the world at the moment. Just wanted to include that for the sake of fairness. I'm just saying, in my subjective opinion, I'm getting a bad vibe from the frame and the priorities that frame sets. It makes me wonder if worrying about human extinction only really matters for the rich, because that's how bad a catastrophe would need to get before it's guaranteed that it would impact them. The fourth problem is that it sets not only too low a bar for success, but also too high a bar for caring. The reason you'd make an argument from preventing human extinction is to make people care, right? But why should caring about an issue hinge on whether it can cause human extinction? Why does something have to get that bad before people give a shit? Isn't it enough that it causes lots of needless death and suffering that we can and should prevent? Or does this hypothetical person you're trying to persuade think that, hey, as long as I don't die and I don't suffer, then what the fuck ever? Doesn't this assume a very selfish person? 
Hey, Editor Weirdo again. Just wanted to expand a little on Toby Ord's overall presentation of climate change, because I want to stress that it doesn't really downplay the threats. Far from it. He highlights that because our current scientific understanding of feedback loops and climate sensitivity are fraught with uncertainty, global heating projections from the IPCC could easily be underestimates. I made a similar point in my very first YouTube video. Climate change could very well become much, 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 much worse than expected, and Ord talks about truly extreme scenarios. I very rarely hear anyone talk about global heating beyond 6 degrees centigrade, yet here he is talking about 13 degrees and more as a real possibility, and of course, warning against them. He also brings up what I think is a profound stat, something I didn't know about and that truly puts this crisis into perspective, and that is that human industry has emitted more than a biosphere's worth of carbon into the atmosphere. Mind-boggling, right? There's good stuff here. Again, Ord takes this threat seriously. This matters to him, and I don't want to suggest anything else. But still, Despite all this, when he rounds out his discussion of climate change in the book by saying that it won't lead to human extinction, it sounds dismissive even if it's not meant to. And that just proves my point about the effect of juxtaposing this threat with human extinction. So those are some of my problems with the extinction frame. I hope you see what I meant when I said that this book inadvertently makes a compelling case for why human extinction doesn't matter. It's quite ironic that that is the message I took away from this book, because human extinction matters a lot to this. Bottom line, with climate change, whether it can cause human extinction or not is entirely beside the point. Preventing human extinction isn't what's important, preventing suffering is. So. I don't see any good reason to argue that we will go extinct because of climate change. Yet, despite it not being human extinction level serious, I still consider the climate crisis to be the most important and urgent threat the world is facing. So, um, yeah. Who's a good school? Who's a good school? Yeah, you are. You're a good school. You're the best at school in the. <sighs> Even though I just spent all this time critiquing this frame, I'm worried that by saying that climate change won't lead to human extinction, I've reinforced the frame and done the very things I've critiqued it for, like undercutting the seriousness of climate change, trivializing the suffering that comes from it, making it seem like it's not a very big deal. Uh, I don't know, maybe I'm just being too hard on myself. I'm at that point deep into the writing of a script where I need to justify to myself why I spent all this time on this project. Is this really the best prioritization of my time in summer of 2023? These days, it feels like a veritable climate doom marathon on my timelines. In between all the memes. Thank goodness for the memes. I need memes after seeing floods demolishing buildings and uh, carrying off cars that I just hope, hope, hope that nobody's inside of. I need memes after seeing reports of heat waves around the world, of heat records being broken everywhere. I need memes after seeing those graphs showing the Antarctic sea ice extent, or lack thereof, the North Atlantic Ocean surface temperature, and the global temperature year over year. I mean, just look at those lines. They're so red and so pointy. They're so pointy in the wrong direction. <sighs> and on top of that, who can forget the hottest day on record? And who can forget the hottest day on record? And who can forget the hottest day on record? And who can forget the hottest day on record? And who can forget the hottest day on record? Day on record? Summer definitely has a different vibe now, as encapsulated in the Simpsons meme. Oh no, not even the memes are safe. Crap.
And now I'm thinking about TPs and FPLs. Oh no, I'm slipping into German mode. No, 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 Deep breath. I'm fine. I'm fine. No, really, I am. I just remember that no matter how much carbon human industry emits, at least we'll never bring the oceans to a boil. What a relief that is. So, I talked earlier about how if you start with the extreme of human extinction, then Everything short of that seems tame in comparison, and we don't want climate change to seem tame. Yet I feel like I've failed to convey how bad climate change is in this video. Hey, Outer Weirdo here again. To rectify this a little, here's a scary map showing that with 2.7 degrees centigrade of global heating, which is where we're currently headed, 2 billion people will be exposed to extreme heats the overwhelming majority of them in the global south, i.e. the people least responsible for all this. That is the tragedy of climate change. Part of the problem is that climate change is a topic that is difficult to talk about in a way that does it justice. Not just because it's depressing, but also because it's hard to convey the sheer scale and impact of it, of this immense, monstrous thing that our brains have a difficult time understanding and treating as seriously as it deserves. It's this extreme and unprecedented thing that demands extreme and unprecedented ways to talk about it. And that's part of the reason why bringing in human extinction as an argument is so tempting. Because human extinction is also an extreme and unprecedented event. Bringing that in seems like a shortcut to conveying how big and serious climate change is. Like, how bad is climate change? It won't lead to human extinction, but it might as well. I and other climate activists just want people to care. Although, maybe that's not the problem. Because most people do care about climate change, don't they? They know it's happening. They know why, they want something to be done about it. The problem isn't how to get people to care. The problem is how to get people to act. But as I hope I've demonstrated above, preventing human extinction is a bad argument for climate action. I don't think it motivates most people to act. I think it can, on the contrary, feed into a doomist mindset and contribute to people thinking that it's too late, we're fucked, we might as well give up. And giving up is, by definition, inaction. So, what should we argue instead? It turns out that I had so many thoughts about this that I will make that the subject of its own video. Because, goodness knows, this video is getting long enough. Final thoughts, though. There is one circumstance where it makes sense to bring in human extinction as an argument. I'm borrowing this point from David Wallace Wells in The Uninhabitable Planet. No matter how bad climate breakdown gets, it will always make sense to try to stop things from getting even worse. That is, unless we literally go extinct. Then we can't do anything, obviously. But before then, we can always do something. Right, that's it, I believe, for now. So, um, have a good one. <laughs>
Ah, not not my nose, not my nose. Stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. Not not my nose.